So my name is Jeremy Weinstein. As Mark said, I'm a professor of political science at Stanford. I'm the director of the Stanford Global Studies Division, and I'm a co-faculty director of the Immigration Policy Lab. I should say something about the Immigration Policy Lab because we're a co-host of today's sessions with uh, CEPR. The Immigration Policy Lab is a group of social scientists uh, building a collaborative approach to doing team science around issues of immigration focused on policy impact and evaluation, on policy innovation, uh, and training a generation of social scientists to think in new and creative ways about immigration policies both in the United States uh, and around the world. If you read my bio, you'd see that I'm a scholar of African political economy, so you might wonder, what am I doing at an event focused on US immigration policy? Um, and I wanted to say that as a start, as an introduction to this session, that for me, coming to this basket of issues was really a function of a role that I played as a policymaker. I served as the deputy to the UN ambassador in the US government, and we were grappling with the largest refugee crisis in the world uh, since the Second World War. And what we saw as large numbers of people were moving across borders from Syria, from the Democratic Republic of Congo, from Eritrea and Sudan, was an international system for managing the flow of people that was coming apart at the seams. A set of norms and expectations about the responsibilities that countries and societies have to protect the most vulnerable was really fraying. And as we looked at what was happening as refugees in particular moved across borders into Europe and the United States, we saw the rise of tensions with host communities and the emergence of an anti-immigrant and anti-refugee politics that ultimately threatened to undermine the ability of countries around the world to manage the movement of people. And so when I came back from that role to Stanford, I was really looking to connect with a set of people who were thinking about issues of migration, thinking about how governments and societies respond to the movement of people, so that we could think not just about what was happening in the United States, but in comparative perspective in Europe, in developing countries that are hosting large numbers of migrants. Uh, and so that's why I joined IPL. Now, at Stanford and, and with institutions like IPL and CEPR, we have grand ambitions to link research and policy. That's how we think about ourselves, the talent, the capability uh, of a university to support policymakers and service providers that are on the front line. And these are grand ambitions that motivate a lot of us who labor on a university campus but want to believe that the research that we're doing will have an impact in the world. But there are two challenges that we often confront in doing that work. The first is a demand side challenge, which is do we have partners on the other side? That is, policymakers who are attuned to thinking about how data and evidence can shape their decision making, service providers who are looking at how to innovate their programs and policies to best serve their beneficiaries. Is there a sufficient demand side to think about this integration? between research and policy. But there's also often a supply side policy, which is that people often become academics because they like to sit in their offices and be left alone. Let's be honest, that's what attracts people in some sense to the ivory tower. Um, and so ensuring that the supply side is actually responsive to the set of issues that frontline service providers, policymakers are thinking about is the other part of making this marriage work. And so as we envision today's session, thinking not only about the high-level policy issues, the immigration experience, Ron's extraordinary research on historical immigration patterns and their effects, we wanted to bring some of the leading thinkers who are on the front lines of dealing with immigrant populations in the United States, the refugee crisis, uh, people from the philanthropic sector who are working on these issues. We wanted to bring them here to really think about the intersection of research and policy, the role of evidence in shaping immigration policies and programs. So we really have three goals for the panels today. The first is to hear about the particular challenges faced by frontline service providers and funders working on immigration and refugee issues. The second is to think about how data and evidence are being used to shape policies and programs. And then the third is to think more broadly about connections between research and practice and opportunities for collaboration going forward. We have three extraordinary guests. You have their bios in front of you, so I'm going to introduce them very briefly and then invite each of them to offer some opening comments about the role that their organizations are playing in the US immigration policy landscape 
and how that landscape is changing given recent developments that we've seen at the federal and state levels. We're going to begin with Melissa Rogers, who's the Director of Programs at the Immigrant Legal Resource Center and the Director of the New Americans Campaign. Then we'll turn to Nina Zelich, who's the Director for Refugee Services at the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. And then we'll end with Sean Moorhead, who's the Program Director for Education and Human Justice at the New York Community Trust and a board member of Grantmakers Concerned with Immigrants and Refugees. And I'd say one of the great things about having these particular guests with us is that the Immigration Policy Lab has been actively connected to each of these organizations in helping them think about the relationship between social science uh, and data production and evidence generation and the work that they're doing. And we will get into that uh, in the course of our conversation. So let's start with Melissa. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I think tying in how we think about programmatic work on the ground, we are nonprofit organizations. The Immigrant Legal Resource Center is a nonprofit. We don't do direct services, but the New Americans Campaign is a network of a couple hundred organizations throughout the country that does direct services. And that tie-in between the work that we're doing on the ground and how policy and research and data inform that work is something that we're here to explore today. So um, the work that the New Americans campaign does is trying to tackle a very specific problem, which is the fact that um, we heard earlier about the size of the immigrant population in the United States. Well, a very large number of that immigrant population, almost 9 million people, are people who have green cards. They're lawful permanent residents. And they've had that green card long enough that they're potentially eligible to become US citizens. And if you think about that, 9 million is a very large number. So one of the first questions we ask, and this is something that um, research has helped answer, is why are more people not taking the step of becoming US citizens? Um, the first thing I wanted to share with you is there are some benefits to becoming a US citizen. Uh, and one of those benefits, and I'll put that one first because this is an economic forum, but one of those benefits is uh, a growth in individual income that is attributable to citizenship alone. There are other benefits. The most obvious one that comes to mind for most people is the right to vote, which is also a right to self-determination, which can affect people's um, pathway and some de decisions that are made, not just in terms of who the president is, but also in terms of what kinds of policies are being implemented at the community level which is a very direct effect on people's lives. Other benefits of citizenship include the fact that if you become a citizen, your children who are under the age of 18 automatically become citizens as well. You also have more pathways to help other family members achieve immigration status, legal immigration status in the US. So it's something that you can use as a benefit to your family. Um, in today's climate of extreme fear we also uh, recognize that having a green card, while it may feel like a protected status, is not a protection from deportation. The only actual protection for de from deportation is citizenship. And the only guarantee, and we saw this with the travel ban, that people who travel internationally, even with their green card, will definitely be able to come back to the US to their home here, is US citizenship. So the benefits of US citizenship are paramount. And yet, um, 9 million people haven't taken the step. So we have done some research to find out why. Uh, and there are many barriers. I just put three of them, the top three, in my opinion, uh, up on this slide. The first one, and we got this from uh, doing public opinion research polling, is that 61% of eligible um, lawful permanent residents, people who knew they were eligible to naturalize, have never received any information from any source about how to do it. The United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, which gave these people their green card, does not communicate about how to apply for citizenship, where to apply, how much does it cost, how long is the form, where can you get help. Um, and this is contrary to policies of places like um, Israel, for example, that actively promote 
citizenship for people. Um, it's not something that would be impossible to do. It's something that this country does not do. There's also been a dramatic increase in the fee to apply for citizenship. So if we look, if we compare to the 1990s to today, we've seen an over 600% increase in the cost of applying for citizenship. And this data point does not exist in a vacuum. When we look at uh, data on the population eligible to naturalize, we know that um, almost 50% of them are below 200% of the poverty line. So having fees for citizenship be, once you factor in, there's also a biometrics fee, so the actual fee is over $700 for an individual, it can become an insurmountable barrier. Now, um, there have been some innovative programs, and actually, Duncan Lawrence, uh, we've had many conversations over the years about experiments in uh, providing fee assistance and providing ways that would publicize the availability of fee waivers, but it does remain a barrier. It's a perception barrier, and it's also an actual barrier. And then a final barrier is that the form, the application form, is 20 pages long. And it's 20 pages of questions that uncover everything about somebody's entire immigration history. It is opening Pandora's box for people who've already gone through the arduous process of obtaining their green card. And, um, and that, that, that form doubled in length since you know, 2010. It was a 10-page form. Now it's a 20-page form. So um, as you may imagine, the desire, particularly in this climate, for individuals to uh, get legal assistance and have somebody look over their application and just make sure they're doing it right is high. And the resources, either people's ability to pay for legal assistance or the number of people qualified to provide that legal assistance doesn't match the demand. We also have a policy context right now in which the processing times that the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services um, the length of time that it's taken to process naturalization applications has grown drastically. So um, just a few years ago, when you applied for citizenship, you could expect five or six months later that you would become a U.S. citizen. Today, due to a growth in backlogs that hasn't been met by uh, an increase in staffing, and it is taking over a year and in some places almost two years uh, for people from the time they apply for citizenship to the time they become citizens. Uh, that means that for people, uh, the uncertainty around the outcome for themselves, the uh, people who are driven to apply for citizenship by a desire to vote, for example, are facing a context in which their ability to realize that aspiration is going to be, um, at best, delayed. So. Our response, and this is what we do as nonprofit organizations trying to crack this problem, we have a, a project. It's called the New Americans Campaign. Um, it is not an independent nonprofit. I work at the Immigrant Legal Resource Center. Our role is to run the New Americans Campaign, but it's truly a collaborative. Um, and it's a collaborative of foundations. It is a collaborative of national immigration organizations, and it's very importantly, a collaborative of local organizations in all of these places across the country that are reaching lawful permanent residents and helping them for free apply for citizenship. Um, you'll see that there are numbers on this map, and this is where we start to really use data, which is we are always looking at where are lawful permanent residents, where are they, where are the populations. Um, we also tailor our work around pillars of how to do the work. The first one being achieving a numerical impact. And then there are other pillars like collaboration, innovation, diversity, and quality. The reason we use those pillars is that we can measure. So we measure impact. We measure um, the success we have in, uh, in having approved naturalization applications for the people we help. We measure how many people we help. We measure the types of settings we help them in. We look at the demographics. We compare the demographics to the demographics of the eligible to naturalize population. And we're constantly adjusting our strategy based on the data. 
We also use data for best practices. So we spend an enormous amount of time looking at how organizations on the ground are actually carrying out the work. Um, are we seeing increases in large workshops, which we have found are more efficient and more effective in serving large numbers of immigrants? Are we incorporating technology tools that can streamline some of the approaches that we use? Are we creating partnerships that serve to drive more people to our services? Um, are we doing things like publicizing fee assistance in a way that's going to mobilize more people to naturalize? And I would say that um, in closing, uh, if I, and this is something we talked a little bit about in preparation for this panel, it's like a, if I had a one wish list item of something that I would point policymakers towards, it really would be on this front end mobilization piece, which is we have an incredible opportunity to be reaching a very large population and driving them to naturalize. And understanding what levers the government has and what levers state and local government have to be able to, to drive people and provide that kind of information would be extremely valuable to this work. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I know it's Friday, so we'll, I'll try and keep you awake. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about the U.S. Refugee Assistance Program, which is a small piece, a small but critical piece of this whole um, immigration sort of policy um, conversation that we've been having today. I'm going to talk about who a refugee is. I think that's important in terms of um, when we talk about citizens or lawful permanent residents or refugees. The resettlement process um, for the U.S. Refugee Assistance Program sort of the 101, but as in a nutshell, because it can be quite complex. And then the role of organizations like mine, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. And then I'm going to talk about the current state of affairs in the U.S. Refugee Assistance Program. We're, at, um, we're in a crisis, um, like many of the other sort of spheres of immigration work going on. And I'm going to talk about my many more than one dream sort of policy issues and concerns I have with where we're at with the U.S. Refugee Assistance Program. So first of all, um, who is a refugee? I mean, obviously, there's sort of the, the legal definition. So a refugee is someone who's outside of their country of origin um, for reasons of fear of persecution on one of five grounds, so race, religion, nationality, pol political opinion, or pol um, particular social group. So any of the, the refugees who are resettled through the U.S. Refugee Assistance Program have to have met that definition um, twice. One is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees definition, and then one is the United States' definition of a refugee. So here you see a picture of refugees who have just arrived to the airport um, in the United States. So they're being resettled in Raleigh. So the, the pathway to resettlement, um, obviously you have to leave your country of origin or you can't be found to be a refugee. Um, and then you need to register with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and go through refugee status determination. So they'll decide that you either are or are not a refugee. And then in some instances, I, I, Jeremy mentioned sort of the largest, um, I think our talking point has shifted a bit actually. We're no longer talking about the largest humanitarian crisis since World War II in terms of displacement, but the w largest displacement crisis ever. Um, so I, I'm sure that's debatable, but that is sort of our talking point that we're using. Um, so in this crisis, there's around 22 million refugees currently. And for a very small number of those, typically less than 1%, they might be referred to a, a resettlement program in a country. So the U.S. is one of many resettlement programs, and the number of countries who have resettlement programs is growing, which is um, a, a really great thing to see, but there are still insufficient resettlement options for refugees who are in need of resettlement because of their particular vulnerabilities. So historically, up until this last administration, the United States has provided an opportunity to thousands of the world's most vulnerable to resettle in the United States I think it's, it was a program that had long bipartisan support. It was 
supported by every president since 1980. And then we have this administration, which I'll get to. Another talking point that shifted with this administration is we used to talk about ourselves being the largest resettlement program or country in the world. And that is no longer going to be the case at the end of September if we remain on track with resettlement numbers. So this year, we are, in theory, supposed to resettle 45,000 refugees um, as part of what's called the presidential determination, which is when the president decides how many refugees will resettle, consults with Congress. So this year, it's 45,000. We're nowhere on track to meet that number. We've resettled a little over 12,000 refugees, and we're seven months through the fiscal year. So we are no longer going to be the largest resettlement country. The EU is overtaking us, Germany taking a large part of that, and certainly Canada in terms of permanent resettlement options. So I think another piece is when we talk about UNHCR referring the cases to resettlement countries, um, they have options, right? They can refer to Canada, they can refer to the US, and they know the profiles of cases that will sort of make it through the, the resettlement programs of those countries. And what we're hearing from UNHCR is that they are redirecting their referrals from the Middle East and North Africa, from the MENA region, to other countries, other resettlement programs. Because right now, even though, you know, in theory, we resettle people from every country um, in the world, <laughs> it would take a Syrian three to five years to get through the program. From, and so they would have to wait an additional three to five years. So they are no longer referring Syrians to the US Refugee Assistance Program, which is a sort of a, it's a problem. Um, so let's say that you are, you know, you've been to site, you're a refugee, UNHCR refers you to a US Refugee Assistance, or to a resettlement program, and that program is the United States. Um, so you enter at that point the US Refugee Assistance Program. You start to go through a, a long process. It's about two years for a non-Syrian or non, um, for most, re for refugees who are not from certain countries. For other, refugees who are from other countries, it's a much longer process. So let's say you start a two-year process. Your case file is reviewed by government contractors. They're basically preparing a dossier for Department of Homeland Security to come in and re-interview you and re-decide that you're a refugee. Um, so if you get past the Department of Homeland Security re-interviewing you, re-deciding your refugee, your security checks start, and that's sort of an extensive, I'm sure it's expensive as well, but extensive and um, long process. So let's say you get through the security clearances, you have to go through medical clearances as well, and then you are resettled. Um, I think a piece about the, the security clearances and the vetting process You've heard, I'm sure, in the news, you know, extreme vetting. Prior to this administration, um, there was also extreme vetting. And we find that, you know, it was for all immigrants coming into the United States, refugees are the most heavily screened. That was true under the Obama administration. It's certainly true now as well, although the process, you know, the changes to the process have probably not added, you know, much value in terms of security. They're looking, instead of looking at five years of a refugee's life overseas, they're looking at 10. Instead of just looking at sort of targeted individuals in a resettlement program, they're looking at the entire family for enhanced screening. So all it's doing is adding time and keeping more people out, people in need of protection, versus actually making us safer. Um, so that's the, the process, right? And at that point, you're resettled to the United States. So here's the role of um, resettlement agencies in the United States. Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service is one of nine domestic resettlement agencies. So we, we resettle in 48 communities in the United States. We meet refugees at the airport. We provide a safe and secure home for them. And I think I just want to um, talk about the volunteer support that's fairly unique. All resettlement agencies have volunteer support, but I think one thing that LIRS really prides themselves on, and this is something we've been working with the Immigration Policy Lab on, is our volunteer and co-sponsorship program. So co-sponsors are groups of volunteers. They're often from the faith community, but they don't have to be by any means, who come together and they work with refugee families through a resettlement agency in a local community 
but they take on a lot of the resettlement work. So we match sort of five times more refugee cases with, with co-sponsors than other resettlement agencies. Um, I think the picture of my family. So this is a report card of the resettlement program in terms of numbers. And I want to use this to show, like, there's a problem. There's a crisis. We're not going to meet our 45,000 um, in terms of actually meeting the presidential determination. But the problem with this for me is that, in a way, the resettlement community has been so focused on the numbers. We're focused on our compliance, which is important. We're all we're government contractors. We receive our funds from the State Department. But we're not focused on thinking about a program, a resettlement program that's, if possible, protected from the political whims of the president, be it a good president or, you know, for me, a good President Obama, but or a president that's destroying the program. So I, I think we need to be thinking ahead. We're going to be caught flat-footed when we resettle 12,000 refugees this year. And so that's one problem. And I don't know what sort of policy or economic solutions there are to that. And maybe it is just a political program. And then we need to decide a program, design a program that can grow and shrink without really harming the people implementing the program. So I think that's one challenge. We're so focused on numbers, and the numbers don't tell a story. I think the other piece I have is we need to be working more closely with the immigrant rights community. So I think that panel that you just saw, you see the DACA recipients, the DREAMers, who have really come out and sort of changed the narrative around their, their immigration issue. And the refugee resettlement community were still catching up in terms of leaders, refugee leaders were there, but we haven't been under attack ever. It's been a bipartisan program since 1980. So figuring out how to work more closely with the immigrant rights community or to build up refugee leaders in a way that, um, that will protect the program, I think those are some critical pieces. I don't have answers to those, but they're things I want to explore. So thank you. It's all right, I'm going to sit down because it's late and I'm going to try to be fast. Um, so when I was in law school here at Stanford, I swore that I did not want a job that had anything to do with money. Um, I wanted to help people and goodness knows I did not want to think about money all day long. Well, all I think about is money all day long. And I am mostly here, I think, to talk about the money flow in the background of the great work that my colleagues here are doing and how research could better inform that money flow. So this is a pie chart that illustrates sources of funding for the field of civil legal services in New York. And I'm using it just as an example to show you the different sources of money that flow into nonprofits working in the immigration or any other field. And you can see here that government is a consistent source of funding, as it is especially for Nina here, um, and that foundations are another source of funding. And the foundation support is actually relatively small in the civil legal aid world. When you look at immigration nonprofits, I think you typically see a larger piece of the pie coming from foundations. So foundations um, provide support often on an application process. You come into a foundation, you say you'd like some money. This is actually the list of funders who provide grants to a nonprofit that is a grantee of mine. It's actually not an immigration grantee, so if you're at a nonprofit, these names are not going to help you at all. Um, it's an education group, but the, it's there really to illustrate the number of funders and philanthropies that this single nonprofit has to go seek funding from. And every single name on that list has a corresponding grant strategy. And on the screen here is actually the grant strategy that I work under for immigration. And I'm not going to read it all to you because it's a little boring, but it's also there to kind of illustrate the complexity of some of the strategies that foundations follow. 
Now to develop our strategy, we usually hire a consultant who has expertise in the field. We have them go around and interview people. They are often people we suggest that they interview. And then they're the people that those people suggest that they interview. So they do have a tendency to be a little self-reinforcing, if that's the right way to say it. And then they do often, and we do often, consult researchers. And it was actually a researcher who helped me draft our strategy. Now, under this strategy, this is just my little New York Community Trust commercial about some of the things that we support, uh, particularly in the immigration context. I got to be in a room with Justice Ginsburg, if you're going to see the um, documentary this weekend, because she came and swore in some citizens at the New York Historical Society who were taking a citizenship preparation course. They're using the Historical Society's collection. Um, that's a nice feel-good grant for us. We also have made a lot of grants uh, to provide legal help for unaccompanied minors who are coming across the border, many of whom actually end up in New York City, and ensuring that all of them uh, actually have access to legal representation with the understanding that having a lawyer, particularly for unaccompanied minors, makes a big difference in their ability to actually get permanent legal status here in the U.S. through asylum or often special immigrant juvenile status. And then we also have a funder collaborative called the Fund for New Citizens that we have 12 different foundations that contribute money to. And then we collectively make grants. And this is just some of the stuff that we've done over the last 20 uh, years. Um, and luckily, I'm not old enough to have been in charge of it all 20 of those years, so I can't really uh, claim credit for it. So then the question is, what does research actually have to do with any of this? And we have been working with the Immigration Policy Lab to think about what are the types of services or the types of, well, we've really have been thinking about the legal service context, that make the most difference in the life of an immigrant with regard to a legal application. So one of the things that a lot of our grantees do is provide what I call brief advice. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but somebody calls on the phone, they say, I have a legal issue. They talk it through with someone who's trained, and then they get some kind of advice, and usually that's the end of the relationship. There's not a lot of information out there about whether those phone conversations are actually changing the outcome for the person making the call. And so the Immigration Policy Lab has been helping us look at what some of the different levels of support are and what difference that they make. And I think I'm allowed to say this, but it's reinforcing a little bit what Melissa was talking about, that getting accurate information is really the threshold that makes the difference between someone taking action and not taking action. And so that's something that will inform us going forward and inform our distribution distribution of resources. But I also think that looking back at that horribly long list of funders that nonprofits have to put up with, research really has the potential to create more consistency and unification around the priorities of different philanthropic organizations because there is a more objective basis on which to make decisions about resource allocation. And so the more that we can find good research and support good research to inform good decisions about distribution of philanthropic dollars, the less difficult life will be for nonprofits um, and the more we'll actually be getting better outcomes for the individuals that the nonprofits are working to serve. So I want to ask you how you've done that and what are the sort of impediments that you've had to overcome in your organizations because I wouldn't say that the, the sort of approach that you are taking and describing in your own organizations is necessarily the norm. Um, and, and in commenting not only on your own organizational experience, sort of, you know, each of you is partnering or engaging governmental institutions in various ways, very directly in the refugee context because you're a contractor. Um, Melissa, you referred to 
USCIS and how they think about you know, engaging their potential beneficiaries with respect or not engaging with respect to naturalization. Um, so for those of you that are working with government, how do you see the culture of evidence uh, in decision making in that context as well? So let's start with Melissa. Where does this culture of evidence come from? How are you able to pull it off in your own organization? What are the impediments? The, the, what was behind it, and I should start by saying I started my legal career as a legal aid attorney, and obviously we looked at outcomes in individual cases, but this idea of systematically looking at um, how do you do the work better, that's something that's generally, nonprofits generally don't have the luxury of having someone who's kind of in a data and evaluation role. Um, it costs money to have that, and it's a hard position to fund. One of the really nice things about the New Americans campaign is that we have someone on staff. She's my colleague. Her name is Sarah Letson. She's very wonderful. Um, and her job is best practices manager. And I've actually never come across a similar position in another legal services or immigration context in this way. Her entire job is to be looking on a quarterly basis at quantitative and qualitative data from every single organization in the field that we're working with that does naturalization. And looking at what do the trends tell us from a quantitative perspective, but also what are some of the nuggets of really amazing things people are doing in the community that move the needle. And then our job is then to figure out how do we share, scale, and spread those things. But it, it comes from having a position. And I would say, I actually think, um, so we do have a lot of funders, uh, which means a lot of proposals and grants. But we, we actually have the luxury also of having a, a tight-knit funder collaborative that supports the work and that came together and decided jointly to fund this position, which we couldn't do with one individual grant. Um, and I think we've, we've had that partnership. The other thing I'll say is that um, the foundation world, while it, while it can put demands on us, can also sometimes, through those demands, force us to do some um, serious thinking <laughs> around things like what works, what data do we have, how do we know this works, what do we want to do more of? And I think it's actually been a, a, a very uh, productive partnership. Great. You know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's um, a few sides. One is, you know, we are a government contractor, so there's challenges. There's been data access or data usage challenges that we've had to work through. Um, and so there's that challenge. I think internally, refugee resettlement organizations are cautious, most of them. <laughs> and I think they certainly don't have, um, most of them don't have like a monitoring and evaluation position or best practices. We are very outcome driven through our government contracts, but getting a team and refugee resettlement <coughs> professionals to think about how can we be doing things better that are outside the government paradigm has been actually really fun as long as you have people around you who want to do that with you. Um, but it's been a mindset change in a lot of ways, um, and for our partners as well. So we work with affiliate partners in those 48 communities, so they're not the same organization, and they have their own cultures and their own um, goals as well. And so not only do we have to convince our organization internally that doing this work is important, around, and I think it's certainly important around making decisions on allocation of resources. So we had, you know, we've made decisions to spend a lot of money on a program, and it's been really great to have a partner like IPL to sort of help us think through whether that's going to make sense five years from now, et cetera. But we have so our internal piece, right, culture there, and then our partners. So I think it's changing minds, right, like t spending a lot of time talking people into that it's worth it and they're not going to lose their jobs um, if they're not deciding where refugees go um, and pieces like that. I want to slightly reframe the question for you, uh, Sean, which is to say in philanthropy, uh, there's been a movement around strategic philanthropy and effective altruism, right? Sort of uh, a pressure that philanthropists are now putting on themselves to think about what returns are being generated by the investments that they're making. On the other hand, when you present us with that nightmare list of grantees for the organization that you described, which 
each of which requires a proposal and a report, you also have a set of philanthropists with their own goals and objectives. Um, so my question to you is, do funders want an evidence base? Do funders want to be constrained by uh, sort of objective information about the returns to different types of investments? Or are they and the organizations they support so committed to particular forms of engagement that it's hard to imagine evidence changing the equation? So the honest answer is that it varies from funder to funder. Uh, if I had to guess, you would see more interest in evidence-based, outcome-based decision-making in institutional philanthropies where you have professional grant makers. So I was going to answer your question about motivations for this. A lot of my motivation around research is just around <coughs> selfishness and insecurity, right? So I have this crazy job of distributing what feels like a crazy amount of money every year, and it shouldn't just be about what seems like the right thing to me, even though I like to think I'm a very good judge of that. But research provides a level of comfort, and I suspect that you would see that fairly frequently, particularly in the kind of professional philanthropic um, world. So I think it was actually the dean of Stanford Law School, Paul Brest, who went to Hewlett, if I'm not mistaken, and was the one who really pushed this strategic grant making and what are you getting for your money. And I think he actually retracted that a little bit a couple of years ago and said, you know, I think we pushed it too far. And I think there is this recognition growing in the field that a push on how many people did you serve and what do we assume the output of that will be can in some instances actually be counterproductive and that we need to be thinking a little differently about what the societal outcomes are of what we're doing. And I think that there is some room to help the field continue to grow as we think about strategy as more than just a cost benefit, you know, and you can tell my colleague from the Robin Hood Foundation isn't here because that's all they do. You know, we'll, we, how much did we give away and what do we think the return on that investment is going to be? But I think that there's room to inform the field. Did I answer your question? Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to reference back to, to Karthik's presentation in the last panel uh, on the importance of importance of perception and framing. So evidence, uh, or let me say, advocacy and the kind of politics of naturalization, the politics of the refugee crisis, these are the terrains on which, in some sense, important policy decisions are being made. So your beneficiaries are making calculations if they know about naturalization as to whether filling out a 20-page form is a smart thing to do. Um, whether they're opening themselves up to certain kinds of vulnerability. With respect to the refugee crisis, I know the resettlement agencies and the advocates have been thinking hard about how you make the case to people that this historical role that the U.S. has played is something that we ought to continue playing. Uh, you know, the joke often in government around vetting when that issue came up, especially from the states, was that you were safer on an airplane sitting next to a refugee than anyone else because the kind of vetting that a refugee had gone through before they were admitted to the United States meant that there was literally nothing uh, that, in terms of risk that they might present to you. And so it brings us to this question about how we think about the kind of policy communication and advocacy being shaped by evidence, not just the program design. Um, and one of the issues, for example, in the refugee space was, uh, you know, should we message to people about the economic returns of having refugees in your communities, because maybe that would address some of the concerns that communities have about welcoming refugees uh, into their own local environment. Um, how do you think about the role of advocacy as you develop, your, sorry, the role of evidence as you think about your advocacy work, the way in which you frame issues, uh, the way in which you message to constituencies and build political support or engage your beneficiaries around naturalization and uh, refugee work? So 
when I, when I think about citizenship, there are many benefits. So it's not so much a question of um, <coughs> whether the benefits are there. It's a question of what's going to resonate with particular audiences. And um, you, know, you could divide it into two main audiences, one being uh, lawful permanent residents that one is trying to mobilize to apply for citizenship, and another being policymakers or governments that might want to invest um, or foundations that might want to invest in supporting that process. And what we uh, have found from also some polling is that for lawful permanent residents, um, there isn't one message, but the messages that do matter are concrete. Uh, everybody has different circumstances, and people are going to be motivated to naturalize for different reasons. For some people, it's voting. For some people, it's they want to immigrate a family member that they couldn't otherwise. For others, they're going to need to do extensive travel. Um, what we have found is that the sort of more patriotic messages tend to be more meaningful at the point at which someone's actually naturalizing. Not in order to convince them to naturalize, but at the point at which people are actually taking the oath of citizenship, there's this sort of emotional swell of becoming an American. But when we're talking um, about the why, you know, there's really concrete reasons why it matters. When we talk to policymakers, you know, it depends. Um, if, a, if a state is thinking of investing in funding services, a state might want to know what are going to be the benefits to me. They might be economic benefits. Um, they might be benefits in terms of also having a more engaged population from a civic engagement standpoint. So I think it's much more of a question of understanding what the concerns are of the constituents than, um, than having just one benefit that's sort of front and center. Yeah, yeah I mean, I would agree with that. And I think it also depends on their concerns. And this is the same statement, basically, but who, who you're talking to. So I think um, there's, you know, we received sort of a briefing on some work that another resettlement agency had done on what messages resonate with more conservative male voters. And I found them to be surprising, but it was, you know, family unity and the idea of protecting a family, and that's why we should resettle. And also the historic commitment that the U.S. has had to, to resettling refugees. Um, and so that, that would work with some, and then there are some where no message will ever work. And so you're going to spend a lot of money trying to reach those individuals, and, and nothing will move the dial. I think the economic messaging on how much money refugees bring to states and communities um, is certainly something we've been using. I don't know if it's working. I think the states understand and the communities intuitively perhaps understand that, that refugees bring in money and they pay taxes. I, I think the challenge is with the resettlement program is it's become a fear of the other. And there I don't know what very well what message works other than sort of a coming out movement of, of refugees saying, I'm your neighbor and I was a refugee you know, 30 years ago, which is why we think you know, doing co-sponsorship programs work in terms of a long-term investment. So I'm going to ask you, unless you want to speak on that issue, I was I come up with all these good answers to your questions, terrific. and then you switch <laughs> on me at the end. You're on. <laughs> so I actually um, am less persuaded that research in the context of persuasive communication is um, much more than just really good uh, communications work. So... It's actually not something that we invest a lot in, um, in part because I'm not so optimistic that we live in a country right now where people are open to a lot of persuasion. Um, what we think of in terms of advocacy is making sure that voices are heard who would not otherwise have the resources to have their voice heard. So making sure that populations that are actually affected by policies have the capacity to be able to speak and be heard in the debates about those policies. And so that's how we look at that piece of it, which I know is not the answer you wanted, but is um, really where we have invested most of our advocacy. 
dollars? I did not have an answer that I wanted. Okay. I think that's a really helpful <laughs> answer, uh, you know, from your perspective as you think about spending resources. Um, we have about five minutes left, and so I want to quickly turn to the audience and see if you have any burning questions before Mark uh, closes us off for the day. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you all for being here and the amazing work that you guys do. Um, this question was sort of pressing on my mind, and it could be for any of you, but how are you guys going, what are the challenges that, you're gonna, that you guys are going to face uh, given the recent administration's crackdown on immigration judges and the speed with which they have to process uh, immigration cases and deportations? Is that going to change at all your calculus and how you target funding for legal services for immigrants uh, versus other funding priorities? So this has been a real issue for us. Um, legal services, frankly, are getting much more expensive per <coughs> case because cases are taking so long to process. And I, I don't know if this is as true in the naturalization context, but in the deportation defense context, cases are taking so long that we can't support nearly as many cases with the same dollars as we used to be able to. Um, and we also have situations where funding streams are breaking. So one thing that's happened a few times in New York lately is that we'll have young people who are in the resettlement shelters, and I don't understand this system very well, but they're in the shelters. When they turn 18, they are no longer in the custody of the shelter, and then they're being turned over to ICE it, when they turn 18, and then they're placed in detention. And the legal representation contracts for them end when they leave the shelter, but then the funding for the deportation defense doesn't start until they've been in custody for two to three months and they get scheduled. So we have 18-year-olds who are in deportation and in custody and there's not a source of support for their representation. Um, and so we're seeing lots of costs associated with it. I think what tends to happen is that providers are actually making very difficult choices about which cases to take based on merits or the vulnerability of the client, um, because the, certainly the philanthropic resources are not growing tremendously. Um, we have seen a lot of city investment in it in New York, though, I will say. Maybe the one thing that I'll add is um, for individual organizations, the decision of whether to invest time and resources into doing deportation defense versus doing naturalization, <coughs> we've had these conversations a lot. For us, naturalization is deportation defense. Um, it's actually the, the only defense, really. And it's also a power building strategy because through naturalization, immigrant communities get the vote and then the right to self-determination. Um, to echo what Sean said, we do see uh, more complex cases coming forward. So sometimes it's because somebody is thinking, well, now I'll naturalize because um, I'm even more afraid not to naturalize than I am to naturalize. But these are people who might have fairly complex cases. So the resources that it takes um, and the level of caution that legal advocates are exercising today has gone up. So the work has gotten slightly um, more expensive. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Um, I'm glad you talked about naturalization as power building. Um, so I'm on the board of the California Endowment. One of our priorities is Census 2020, um, and especially with this proposed citizenship question. I'm wondering how you all are thinking about it. One way I would like to think about it is to think of, <coughs> of the sense For us, it's core. So we have a conference every year, which is a best practices exchange. And usually, it's just peer-to-peer -peer folks talking about how to do the work. We were talking about the census. Um, part of it is that we're going to be telling communities a lot of different things in 2020. We're going to be telling people to vote. We're going to be telling people to naturalize. We're going to be telling people to get counted. Then we're going to be telling people who aren't citizens not to register to vote. <laughs> so there's going to be a lot of complex 
Um, and we have to be thinking about how to do that. But absolutely, um, you, you really can't talk about immigration and not talk about the census. Um, and uh, we're, we're all worried. We're all worried about a massive undercount. So, um, yes. <laughs> No, I mean, I, yeah, I think that was a good answer. In terms of refugees and naturalizing, that's critical. And I think they, they we hope they naturalize. We provide support resources. But I think you probably have more, more to add. I, I think you're probably going to see a lot of uh, interest and willingness from the philanthropic community to figure out how to best cope with the question on the 2020 census. And we've already actually seen more activism in the philanthropic community than I've seen, frankly, around any other topic around this question, the citizenship question on the 2020 census. And so I anticipate that that will likely then be reflected in resources that will hopefully do exactly what I think you're looking for people to do, which is to figure out how to use the census as an opportunity instead of seeing it as a real um, threat, which Frankly, for those of us in New York, the resource, um, the government resource uh, implications for a census undercount are tremendous. I just want to say on behalf of CEPR and IPL, thank you so much, the three of you, for being with us and sharing the extraordinary work of your organizations. So I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>